Welcome back. In this lecture, we're going to be talking about two different ways of us defining the six trigonometric functions. Uh, we've already looked at defining the trig functions where the angle is inside of a right triangle. And now we're going to think about what if we have just an angle drawn in standard position. This way we won't be limited to the size of our angle because of course if you're an angle in standard position you can be as large or as small as you'd like. Could be positive, could be negative. And so here the plan will be that once we have our angle drawn in standard position then on our terminal side, we can pick any point that we'd like. So whatever point that we pick, of course, it's going to have an x-coordinate and a y-coordinate. And I'll also have, in addition to my x and my y-coordinate, I'm going to have a third number that I'm going to need to use, which is my value for r. And that's the distance from the origin to the point that we've picked. And so the value of r, we can find that essentially just using the Pythagorean theorem. r is square root of x squared plus y squared. So one thing that's going to be immediately obvious here is because x and y are coordinates, then depending on where the angle is, x might be positive or negative and y might be positive or negative. Uh, for the angle that I've drawn here that happens to be in quadrant 2, the x value for sure is going to be something negative and the y value for sure is going to be something positive. Uh, one thing, of course, though, is that since r is a length, then no matter where the angle is, r will always be something positive. Now, if you're taking a look at the drawing that we have here, you can see that from the point x, y, I've drawn a little vertical line down to my x-axis, and that's actually made a little right triangle for me. I say right triangle, but I mean it not really in the sense that it's a right triangle with positive lengths, because here the value for x is not the length of this side. The value for x is going to be a negative number, because x is, in this case, an x-coordinate. So we do have a, a sort of a right triangle whose side lengths are x and y and r, but again, x and y aren't really truly lengths. They're coordinates. They might be positive or they might be negative. Now, the nice thing about this is that if we're thinking about our angle theta and asking ourselves what's the relationship to our sides to that angle theta, I'd say, well, it looks like my side y is the side that's opposite of angle theta. So that's definitely the opposite side. And for my angle theta, x would be my adjacent side. And of course, since my 90 degree angle is right here, then that means R is my hypotenuse. We're going to see that the definitions that I'm going to give for sine and cosine and everybody else, they're going to be in terms of X's and Y's and R's, but essentially it's going to be the same definition as before. So for example, we know that sine, we defined it before as opposite divided by hypotenuse. And here we're going to say instead of opposite and hypotenuse, we'll say y and r. So we have our six trigonometric functions all defined in terms of y's and r's and x's. And essentially it's the same definitions as before. Opposite over hypotenuse. Cosine, x value was our adjacent side, so it's again adjacent over hypotenuse. Tangent is y over x. y was the opposite side. x was the adjacent side. So tangent is still opposite over adjacent. The other thing to also notice here is that the trig identities all still are the same as before. Sine and cosecant, they're both reciprocals of each other. Cosecant, uh, sorry, secant and cosine, they're both reciprocals of each other. Tangent and cotangent, they're both reciprocals of each other. One new thing that we've added in here is that since y and x are coordinates, and the coordinates could be zero, so for example, if we're thinking about, let's say, a 90 degree angle, then whatever point we pick, the x value is going to be zero. And that means any trig function that has x in the denominator is going to wind up being undefined for that angle. And so that's the price that we pay. We are going to be able to find the values for any trig function for whatever angle we'd like. However, that means that there's the possibility for certain angles that four out of our six trig functions, tangent, cotangent, secant, and cosecant, all have places where they're undefined. 
Okay, so let's get ourselves going with this first problem. And for this problem, we've got an angle that's been drawn in standard position, and it's supposed to pass through the point 3, negative 6. So I guess first thing I should probably do is just do a little quick sketch of my angle and that point. So I'm just going to quickly draw for myself roughly 3, negative 6, 3 across, 6 down, so somewhere around there. And that means the angle that we're talking about happens to be in quadrant 4. We want to find the exact values for all six of my trig functions. And so already we know two of the three values that we need. We know that x is 3 and we know that y is negative 6. So only thing left to do is find our value for r. And then once we have x and y and r, we can go right ahead and find all six of our trig functions r is the square root of x squared plus y squared so that would be 3 squared and negative 6 squared which gives us 9 plus 36 or 45 and of course as always we have to make sure that our roots are in simplest terms 45 is 9 times 5 so root of 45 is root of 9 which is 3 times root of 5 Okay, so we've got everything we need as far as our values for x's and y's and r's. And I'm going to do things kind of in the same way that I did before when I was doing the right triangle trig. I'm going to use my reciprocal identities, so I'm going to really be finding all of my trig functions in pairs. I'm going to start off with first finding sine, and then once I know what sine is, I can use that to find cosecant. And I'll do the same thing for all the other pairs. So let's start off with sine of theta. We know that that is y over r, and our y value is negative 6, and r is 3 root of 5. Of course, we're going to have to simplify things, so that means rationalizing our denominators. And then, of course, simplifying things further, the 6 and the 15, we can divide both of those by 3, giving me my value of sine as negative 2 root 5 over 5. Okay, and once I know my value for sine, then that means I can also find my value for cosecant, because since sine is negative 6 over 3 root 5, then cosecant should be the reciprocal of this. It should be 3 root 5 over negative 6. And when I simplify that, that's negative root 5 over 2. All right, we've got sine taken care of and cosecant, so now we'll just continue on with cosine and secant, then tangent and cotangent. So moving onwards to cosine, which is x divided by r. Our x value was 3, and r was 3 root of 5. So again, rationalizing our denominators. And then simplifying the 3 and the 15, I can divide both of those by 3, leaving me root 5 over 5. And then once I know cosine, I also know the value of secant, because secant and cosine are reciprocals. So since cosine is 3 over 3 root 5, then secant should be the reciprocal 3 root 5 over 3, which simplifies to just give me root 5 over 1, which is the same thing as root 5. And then last two, tangent and cotangent. Tangent being y over x, and our y value was negative 6, and our x value was 3. So tangent was equal to negative 2, and since cotangent is the reciprocal of tangent, and tangent was negative 2, then that means cotangent should be negative a half. Uh, one thing I want to point out before we move on to another example here, we have for our six trig functions, four out of the six happen to be negative, sine and cosecant and tangent and cotangent. And those are all the ones that involve y, because in this case our y value happens to be negative. 
Um, something we're going to think about for the future is that really in any of the quadrants, quadrants two or three or four, you're going to have X or Y or both of them happening to be negative, which is going to make some of our trig functions happen to be negative. And that's going to be a running theme that we'll see. So in quadrant one, where everybody is positive, our trig values will always be positive. But for the other three quadrants, some of our trig functions will be positive and some will be negative. All right, so let's do another example here. This time we've got an angle drawn in quadrant three, and apparently our value for tangent is four sevenths. Uh, this is a place where we kind of need to be careful because there's no drawing given, and if I didn't have a drawing given and I wasn't really thinking too much about quadrants, and I just thought about tangent being equal to four sevenths, and thinking about how tangent is y over x, I might be tempted to say that y should be equal to 4 and that x should be equal to 7. Except I'd be wrong, because if we think about where the angle is, our angle is supposed to be in quadrant 3. And that means if you are in quadrant 3, then whatever x and y value you have, both of those will be negative. You're in the part of the x-axis where x is negative, and you're on the part of the y-axis where y is negative. So if I said y was positive 4 and x was positive 7, I would definitely be wrong. That would be true if we were thinking about an angle in quadrant 1. But since we're in quadrant four, uh, quadrant three rather, x and y both are negative. So x should be negative seven and y should be negative four. So I'm just gonna write that in on my little diagram there. And now we'll do the same thing as before. We're gonna find our value for r. And then once we find our value for r, we can then go ahead and find our exact value for sine. So now let's do that. r is square root of x squared plus y squared, or negative 7 squared plus negative 4 squared. And that's 49 plus 16, or 65. And root of 65, that's as nice as it's going to get. There are no perfect squares that go into 65. So now I'm ready to give the answer to my question. And the question was, what is the exact value of sine of theta? And I know sine of theta is y over r. And the y value was negative 4. And r was root 65. Of course, we're not finished yet. We still need to rationalize the denominator. So my final answer should be negative 4 root 65 over 65. Now, we have another way of talking about our trig functions. And this is just throwing one little extra restriction on things, which is instead of just talking about our angle anywhere and picking any point on our terminal side, we're now going to think about our terminal side crossing with our unit circle. So I'm just going to do a little diagram here for a minute. Before we were thinking about an angle and we just picked any old x and y that we felt like picking on that terminal side, but now we're thinking about that angle within a unit circle. And if you're in a unit circle, the radius is 1. And if the radius is 1, then that means our value for r is always going to be 1. That really simplifies things for us, because instead of saying sine of theta is y over r, now sine of theta is just y, because of course if you're in the unit circle, then r is equal to 1. And same thing for cosine. If you are thinking about cosine, the original definition we gave was x over r, but within the unit circle, r is 1, so that means cosine of theta is just x. So if we're thinking within a unit circle, actually that makes things a lot easier for us. Um, so let's see an example here of something within in a unit circle. So away we go. We've got ourselves an angle, theta. The terminal side crosses the unit circle at that point, 3 fifths, negative 4 fifths. And we want to find the values of all six trig functions. And so this is actually supremely easy to do just because the fact that we're talking about an angle within the unit circle. That means that all of our trig functions are only going to be in terms of x and y. 
and x being 3 fifths and y being negative 4 fifths is something we know. So now we're ready to go. We know what sine is. Sine is our y value. So sine is negative 4 fifths. And of course, the reciprocal of sine is cosecant. And so cosecant should be the reciprocal of negative 4 fifths, which is negative 5 fourths. We know what cosine is. Cosine is just our x value. And our x value is 3 fifths. And we also know that secant is the reciprocal of cosine. And since secant is the reciprocal of cosine and cosine is 3 fifths, then secant should be 5 thirds. So the only one that we're actually going to have to do any calculations at all for will be tangent, and that's because tangent is y divided by x, or in other words, negative 4 fifths divided by 3 fifths. So we just have to do one quick little calculation here, and we find that tangent is negative 4 thirds. And then once we know tangent, now we can just go right ahead and jump to the value for cotangent. Since tangent is negative 4 thirds and cotangent is the reciprocal of tangent, then cotangent should be negative 3 quarters. Um, and again, same as before, notice we have for our trig functions, some of them, in fact, four of them happen to be negative and two of them happen to be positive. So whether we're talking about angles in standard position or whether we're talking about angles within a unit circle, in either case, if we're talking about an angle that's not in quadrant one, then we're talking about trig functions that may be positive or may be negative.